Whether you're an avid property investor or about to buy your first property, why do it alone when you could partner with Australia's best buyer's agent? Director of Pure Property Investment, Property Investment Professionals of Australia board member and REB Buyer's Agent of the Year, Paul Glossop, can take your portfolio to the next level. Get in touch today to discuss your investment goals. Get one-on-one insight from Paul Glossop. And for the first 100 people, this service is completely free. Head to purepropertyinvestment.com today to schedule your consult with Paul Glossop directly. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. G'day everyone, how are you going? Welcome to the show and it's what everyone's been waiting for. I've been copping a bit of heat lately from our Smart Property Investment community wanting more questions answered on air. So I've moved heaven and earth and I've made sure that our team here is supercharged in order to be able to do a lot more of these moving forward. So commitment from me, hopefully we're going to try to aim for once a month to do a Q&A session. I'll bring in different people over that period of time to make sure that I have the right talent in the studio Tell me answer a lot of these questions coming through. And you may remember if you've been tuning in recently, we uh, created a whole new, um, let's call it a widget for the sake of simplicity, where you can actually record your questions now and we can play them out on air and answer them on the fly. And that's what we're going to do today. So helping me out with this, you may have heard of him on the podcast before, Paul Glossop, Pure Property Investment. He's the managing director there. And some say he knows a little bit about property. Some say. Thanks for having me again, Phil. Yeah, is that myth busted yet? Well, mate, we are the reigning buyer's agent of the year, so I'll let the notion of what we've won as accolades do the talking for the time being. Yeah, that's a very safe response. <laughs> <laughs> so Q&A, is you okay to do that? Absolutely, I love okay. it. Okay, and so, you know, we should really video these because, again, people are asking for that as well. Yeah. We have no idea what these questions are going to be. Nothing at all. And our podcast producer here, James, is How we sitting here. There he is. He's got a microphone in front of him. So he's going to be controlling the machines here. There's a lot of machines that help us do all this sort of stuff. And so, James, people have been recording these questions via smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. There's a big button that says They have record. indeed, yes. 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 And yes. lots have been coming in. So we've been wanting to do this for a little while. So thanks to you and your team for getting this ready to roll. So how, how many questions have we got loaded up? I don't know if we're going to get through them all, but- uh, So I've, I've chosen three for today, okay. Phil. All right. And, yeah, and so they're all a bit different? They're all a bit different, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's cool. And there's also the old analog way of doing this. We've also got an email here from a person called Terry B., and we'll answer that question as well. So we've got three audio questions and one written question. And we'll, we'll do that one last because it's very – I actually know what that question is, so it's very relevant to where we are right now. So without further ado, let's get second. Are you ready, Paul? Are you going to be okay? Ready and you rolling. sure? Yes. A little bit nervous. All right. James, over to you, mate. All right. Let's do it. Hey, my name is Alex, and um, I have two properties. One is a house in Chelsea, and the other one is a unit in Hyatt. My question is – whether I should sell Hyatt and um, build um, at the back in Chelsea a three-bedroom, two-bathroom townhouse and hopefully generate income from both, or maybe sell it, or maybe I should keep Hyatt and um, hopefully it will keep on increasing in value and leave it as it is. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this and hopefully I will hear from you soon. Thanks, Alex. That's cool. I like how that works. Yeah, it's a really good way to get questions. So a couple of things... Alex, point number one, and this is for all our listeners, you know, and I apologize for having to do this, but it's necessary. It's just a general chat. We're not giving any advice whatsoever around this. It's just our opinions on the information that's been presented to us, in this case by Alex, who has some circumstances that he's looking to capitalize on opportunities. So this is just our musing about it. So by any means, this is not advice, and that's the appropriate way for go about doing this. Number two, this is way outside my pay grade. I don't do this for a living. Paul Glossop does. So I'm going to ask him to give us his insights on that. And I know this is a strategy that you're quite familiar with, Paul, this sort of stuff, uh, and you actually go out and identify assets like this for this particular purpose. Now, I have no idea where Chelsea or Hyde is. Do you? If it's – well, there's a few different ones. I know, I know Chelsea Chelsea's. in the in the UK. Yeah, <laughs> there's – um, I believe he's in Victoria, and I'm assuming okay. he's down the south side, probably along the bay side there. So Chelsea's a bit more on the water. Hyatt is – depending how you pronounce it, so I think it's H-I-G-E-T-T. 
On that spot, James, can you get some numbers up for us so we know what's happening in those places But well, while, while you're at that? Yeah. yeah. So the question, I believe, was probably more revolving around building on the back of retaining and looking at those different options. But if I probably more specifically look at where that market's heading, we're actually looking for a client in Dingley Village, which is really, really close to Hyatt itself, as far as it's one of the neighbouring suburbs there. We've been on the search for a client in there since November for a particular property with a very healthy budget. Just to give some background on what's happening in that market, I think we've got a budget of upwards of about 920 grand. Okay. Trying to find a 600 square meter family home, not exclusively highly renovated or developable, just essentially a family home in that market. And we've missed out on, I think at last count, six or seven properties in that market. Majority, and this is the big drama right now, especially in those exclusive markets, is we're seeing clearance rates as of the last three months and probably getting stronger by the week. Everything's going to auction. There's heaps going of punters out there looking to buy, not a lot of properties on the market. That is that market in a nutshell. So the position I have is kind of depends on what do you want to do long term. Those markets have got a lot of demand, especially right now. They are definitely highly priced. Cash flow is average, like most of those markets. If you're looking at those exclusive Bayside markets or the middle ring markets, desirable owner occupiers, Sydney's no different to that. Brisbane's a little bit better. But when it comes down to what do we do with the options of what do we do with these markets is that they're rebounding at a hefty note right now. I think if you chose to exit either of those two assets in the next 12 to 24 months, you'd probably be shortchanging yourself given the fact that we've seen a rebounding growth now of somewhere between 5 and 8% over the last 6 to 10 months in each of those markets. It's probably only really making up lost ground for the last two years, so it's probably breaking around about the same numbers two years ago. But that being said, if you're going to make a decision on those two properties, regardless of whether it's to keep, to build or to sell, I'd be sitting tight for at least a 12-month period to let that market do what it's got to do. Wouldn't it be an argument, and I'm sure this is what Alex is thinking about, and the picture we just painted around a lot of positive pressure on prices that go upwards because of buyer demand mm. and high auction clearance rates. If you were going to want to sell and capitalise on growth that you may have received, wouldn't now be the time to do that on one of these assets and, and maybe park that money elsewhere in a place that should go up in value? There is an argument for it, but I think there's also an argument to say, is it going to be too soon? I truly think that when you've got 80% clearance rates, which is looking likely to stay that way for some time, you've got another rate cut that's in law likely coming somewhere between the end of quarter th- quarter one, quarter two, somewhere quarter three, maybe the second one towards the back end of this year. So we're going to have cheap rates here to stay, five-year rates of 3.5% being locked in, fixed by the big four. The picture that is being painted is that cheap money's here to stay. Access to credit's going to be very, very good for a good period of time with cheap money there as well. So lower rental rates aren't going to be a big drama for a lot of investors to hold these properties like it probably was two or three, four years ago. Yes, there's money to be taken now. It's definitely become a seller's market holistically. But then you ask yourself the question, if you're not going to repurpose that money, if you're going to repurpose in that same market, what's the point? Unless it's something that's going to be a really exclusive opportunity that you've got that no one else can maybe see. But if you're going to go and reinvest in that same market, you're going to be hit with the same wall of pressure that everyone else is trying to buy is, which is 85% clearance rates, basically everything selling, competing with everyone else, redistributing your stamp duty that you're never going to get back, and remembering that you've got a transaction cost of buy to sell of somewhere between 7 and 9%. So you've really got to always take that into consideration that if unless that money's going to make you probably more than that over the next 12, 24 months, I'd consider saying sit tight for the time being or alternatively speak to your broker or your borrowing strategist or even your property buyer's agent say, is there a way to maybe recycle debt out of it, hold that property as it's going through a growth cycle and look at redistributing it and try to be a bit more clever without actually having to exit the property as well. So these sound like good assets. And again, we're just assuming, right? We don't know a lot of the facts or where they are, what properties or whatever, but these sound like assets which are going to be hard to replace in this current market yep. or to realise significant value through shifting it and moving somewhere else. So he's talking about a value add play, right, about maybe doing something in the back of it. Mm. What's your views on like – granny flats, splitting blocks, you know, as an investment strategy. Yeah, we do it very, very regularly. Like we're literally doing an audit across about 150 properties we've secured for clients across the East Coast over the last 18, 24 months, which actually are suitable for either a granny flat or a subdivision or something that's higher density. And we are very big proponents of it at the right time for the right client. But it comes down to the fact that if you are adding value, 
Yes, you can typically extract equity if you've got it available in that property, but then you've always got to ask yourself the question, is that money that you're using going to be better utilized in another investment or is it going to give you a value add increase? So if you're looking for cash flow, I would definitely say that granny flats, those types of scenarios in those markets aren't going to be working. So granny flats in Victoria, different kettle of fish full stop compared to New South Wales, Queensland and some other states as well. If it's a value add and you're looking at a strata title or Torrens title, then yes, that market in those particular areas where you've got tight supply for boutique small accommodation, there is going to be some scenarios that will make sense. So if you can value add and you know that you've got the opportunity to do it based on the size of those blocks, it's not a bad time to do that because there is demand there, especially if it's going to be a full torrens or strata titled sellable asset. Mm. And that's the key is that if it's going to be two dwellings, one title and that kind of secondary accommodation, not necessarily that concerned or all that amped about thinking that that's a good strategy on that particular location. What's it like, you know, say you're going to go down that path and I'm not that familiar with that market. Yep. Like I've Googled it now and I know where it is and I sort of, I know of that particular area. I know the Mornington Peninsula and all that sort of stuff, right? You know, you're asking the right questions, Alex, in terms of you probably want to get some good advice around this Yeah. outside of just the musings we're having. This is not advice or yep. whatever. But it is a good strategy. It is an effective strategy. But, you know, can you get builders now down there? You know, is it just some sort of, you know, I choose product number A, chuck that on the back of it. You know, I don't know the council you know, yeah. rules and regulations down there. So it's pretty complicated. Have you got any numbers, James, for Chelsea? Yeah, I do. I've got higher and I've also got Chelsea up here. So yeah. Chelsea, median house price, 765000 Median quarterly growth is 5.23%. Over 12 months, it's fallen 11.51%. Over three years, it's seen a negative 7.27% negative growth. Over five years, it's seen a median growth of 37.68%, yep. with a 10-year average annual growth of 5.74%. And a gross rental yield of 3.13%. Okay. So it's not necessarily a, a good yielding suburb, but in terms of the buying cycle, I could see why probably a lot of people are in there right now because, you know, just hearing those numbers, I'm painting a mental graph in my yep. head. It's seen some growth. It's dropped over the last three years, yep. which is consistent with Correct. the market. Has it bottomed out? Maybe, yep. you know, is it already on the way up? Probably with considering yeah. the supply and demand dynamics. So, Alex, my point for you would be keep asking the questions. You probably want to speak to a number of different people to get a feel for what the right opportunity. One would be a, a property strategist, someone like Paul. There's guys that do that sort of stuff. Just amuse over what those opportunities would be and asking the questions around, you know, liquidating assets to try and recapitalize that elsewhere. You want to speak to your accountant because it's going to be tax implications around that. You've got to work out whether or not you can get the borrowing and the financing as well. I have no idea about your personal situation and your ability to secure funds from banks. Anecdotally, it's getting a little bit easier to secure money uh, from the banks. They've reduced some of their serviceability requirements. And there is a, they're competing for customers right now. So it's not a bad time to be getting finance if you can get it. And there's another interest rate, potential interest rate cut coming along the way. So go and do all that. Let us know how you get on. We're quite keen for a follow-up from you once you know. And if you want to email the team, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, maybe we can come on the show and have a chat about it. We'd really appreciate that. Paul, we're going to go to a quick break and then we've got some more questions after it. Back in a moment. Worried about making the wrong choice with your next investment? You're not alone. If you truly want to become the master of your own lifestyle design through real estate, then you need to speak with Dashdot Buyers Agents, who will help you acquire cash flow positive properties in high growth areas with value add potential, so you can create more freedom in your life. Visit dashdot.com.au forward slash SPI. Welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed the Smart Property Investment Show, which is part of the Smart Property Investment Podcast Network. Heaps of shows now uh, that we're running through. I uh, really enjoy delivering this and in the studio with me on this Q&A episode is one of our regular guests, uh, Paul Glossop, Managing Director, Pure Property Investment. And we're answering some of our listeners' questions. James, do you have a next one for us, please? I sure do. Let's take it away. Hey, Phil. Love the show. Long-term listener. I uh, just wanted to know, what is your biggest purchase regret and why? Biggest purchase regret and why? Good question. Uh, who was that, James? Uh, we've just got Mike here Mike. from Mike. All right. Thanks, Mike. Completely off the cuff and on the fly, my biggest purchase regret is not purchasing more properties when I could have purchased it. Such a cop-out answer. I it's knew you were going to say that. I knew it. <laughs> but it is. I, I look back to um, the early days, and, and it's a good question, Mike, and I think everyone should ask themselves this because it's going to make them reflect and therefore be a better property investor. I don't want to get too philosophical about that. You can read Paul's book if you want that. It's full of 
Bestseller. Is it a bestseller? Bestseller. What's it called again? A Surfer's Guide to Property Investing. Okay. Mm. And do you need to be a surfer to really appreciate it? Well, it's my guide. I'm the surfer, uh, but ultimately it could be a fisherman's guide to property investing or it could be a man who likes to do very little on the weekend's guide to property investing, which you'd probably prefer that title and and probably get you to read it. But ultimately it's just about property investing. So the metaphor, and I'm getting off track, sorry, Mike, but the metaphor of the surfing is that's by being good at property and realising why that gives you more time to do that stuff. Absolutely. And that's pretty much why we're all here and talking about property is that Mm. we're trying to buy time. Yeah. So I've read the book. I was going to give you a hard time about being (laughs) in the discount (laughs) bin, but still at the airport. But still there. I was in Byron Bay last week, or my missus was. I was there next to her. It was in one of their Collins bookstores, front and centre. Wow. At the top end, above Koshy's book and below someone else's. Do do you walk down the streets now and people go, oh, look, that's Paul Koshy. Absolutely. And people are pulling out books left, right and centre asking for signatures. (laughs) I can't walk to my car or take my kids to school without getting accosted. No, it's not that way. Have you got a box of them in your boot and you just can't, you just go, I'm sick of the storage costs. Free book, free book, free book. Pretty much. Yeah. 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 Anyway, that's digress. But your book does touch on this and you need to be reflective as a property investor, be a better property investor, the philosophy of it. So for me, Mike, and it's something, and it's one of the reasons why we created Smart Property Investment was for this particular purpose. You know, 10 odd years ago, it was probably eight years ago when we created the brand, you know, the philosophy of doing that was that there was so much misinformation around property investment. We felt that people didn't actually get the real story of what's going on. You only heard, it was the Instagram of property investment. You only heard the good stories. No one ever spoke about that, bad stories. And there is normally as many bad stories as good stories, right? So we went, let's go down this journey. Let's talk about it. And talking about the mistakes that we've made has been a big part of that. And seriously, like this is the biggest regret I've ever had in terms of property is that when we started investing in property and I was a lot greener than what I am right now, I could have doubled down more so, doubled down on the number of properties I secured at that point in time, both in terms of ability to secure finance, which way back then was a lot easier and the mechanics of doing so was a lot simpler, Uh, could have doubled down on it and probably doubled the size of our portfolio to where we are today. And that was during a period of time in Sydney when it was on a huge run. You remember, you you sort of started at a similar time. We're buying places all over the joint. We could have done twice as many. Absolutely. But for me, it was a bandwidth time problem Yep. rather than a accessibility to finance or Swiss We were using a buyer's agent at the time to do that and who still bought by our properties now. That's my biggest regret. It is a bit of a cop-out thing, but that's true. Yeah. You, you know you know our portfolio pretty well. Yeah, you yeah. Know. No, I've seen plenty of your properties and lend a hand on a shovel and a, mm. and a very dodgy paint job here and there yeah. until we realise that you've got to do proper paint jobs because otherwise you're, true. the tight ass pays twice and you yes. have to do that paint job the next year again. Mm. You might be asking me as far as the next question, Paul, what's your biggest regret, which I dare say is probably the next question. I'm going to work out what, what's your biggest regret. What would it be? All right, you probably know what I own and where I own personally pretty well as well. And well, I reckon a- your biggest regret in property was buying a property in Musselbrook. You'd be probably pretty close. Yeah. And and here's the facts as, as far as why. I've got any clients of mine who ask me these questions. I'm fully open book with where my portfolio sits and what I do with it. And the biggest thing I've had in my portfolio over the years is it's changed. And mm. it has had to change because my skills, my knowledge and where and what markets to buy and not to buy in has to change. Because if you're fixed on Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or or Port Hedland, you're going to have some good days, you're going to have some really bad days. Mm-hmm. And that is the key. So Musselbrook is a property I bought. I probably own that property now for maybe six odd years. And I've done a full renovation on that property back when I bought it. The regret I have of that property, I haven't lost money on it. Mm-hmm. But the money it took to do that renovation firstly, as well as the time it took to complete that renovation and we talk about this all the time is the opportunity cost of what I could have been doing other than that is probably where I, you know, theoretically, if I kept doing what I was doing elsewhere in my own portfolio, where I've got quite a number of properties in the Sydney market, quite a number of properties in the Brisbane market, I've got some very hefty development sites that I'm working on as well. Even if I just took that same money and put it into a set and forget in the Sydney market at that same time, it's probably the difference of maybe 150 grand, Mm. maybe a bit more over time. Cash flow wise, it actually didn't hurt me. It probably bettered my situation. So I look at it on that side of things, yes. And that was probably one of the properties which I've personally bought, which funnily enough, I'm actually preparing to sell at the moment because I'm now getting to the point in my portfolio where I've actually got more than enough that I need in there mm. as far as cash flow and growth and the balance of the two. I've got more of a focus on value add developments and looking at recycling money on a bit more of an active process. But I've also now got an eye on saying if I can 
de-debt my portfolio, which I'm in the process of doing. And that's by selectively selling. I'm actually going through the process personally of selling three properties, which the intention is to then right size the portfolio to take out properties which I don't any longer need because I know from a growth perspective and from a cash flow perspective, they're not going to add any more than what they've already provided me. And then I'm more or less looking and say, I want as little moving parts as I possibly can to get the maximum result. And there's probably three properties now in my pretty pretty expanded portfolio, which I just don't see that I need in the future. Even if they continue to grow, it's not going to make me feel like I've missed out because I can then take that same income, same utility of borrowing capacity as everything else that goes with it to then redistribute to larger scale development sites, which I'm actively doing personally. So it's only where you get to a point where you are right now being a sophisticated investor where in hindsight, you look back and look at where those biggest regrets are. Yep. But, but unless you're in the game and on that journey, you don't get the privilege of doing that. You don't get the privilege of regrets. No, <laughs> you, don't, you don't actually get the privilege of regrets, which is an interesting way to frame it because a lot of people will will sit there and might, let us know where you are with your portfolio. I'd be interested to know. But, um, you know, they're so hesitant to get in the game that they never have the opportunity to have these regrets, right? And as long as the regrets, you know, my regret isn't I bought a property in Port Hedland for $800,000, then the mine's fell apart and now it's worth $200,000 and I've got eight seven dollars of debt on it. Like that's a bad spot to be, right? Massively. Yeah. You know, our regrets are more about missed opportunities. Yeah, you know? And exactly. there's little little tinkering things we could have done differently. I've, there's a couple of properties in our portfolio. One of them, and if you go and check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au is in Kingston, which is a suburb of Brisbane. Man, that thing's been an absolute nightmare mm. the whole way through it. Roof leaks, ceilings fall in. Tenants don't go in. Problem, 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 yep. problem, problem. I feel like I just want that out of my portfolio. It's an actual absolute nuisance and headache, but I haven't got the time or bandwidth to worry about selling it. So I'm just going, I'll just leave it. And that is know. the struggle. And probably if I touch on the last thing about regrets, and I speak with probably up to somewhere between every month, between 50 and 70 new investors mm. every single month as part of what I do on day in, day out. People book in some time with me. We have a chat about it, about their current position, what they're trying to do and potentially try to strategize what a process or a philosophy for their own portfolios would look like. The most difficult discussions I tend to have there are people who are probably in the position in life where they've got their family home or potentially they haven't even done that, but they're at the point in where they might be late 40s, mid 50s, even potentially moving into their 60s. And they've talked about the fact that they were thinking about doing this in the 90s and in the noughties and then now in the decade that's just passed us, we're, we're at the point now where they've missed really a very, very distinct time in their lives where they could have done something. And it's tough to be able to set a strategy for five years in property to say, here's where you're going to end up. And anyone who's going to say you're going to make money in five years, unless you really know what you're doing and how to recycle money actively, which takes decades of knowledge to get to that Mm. point, it's a hard position to be in. So I'd much prefer to see someone say, I've got three properties in my portfolio and that one's a dud. If you've got that scenario, at least it tells me that you've taken action because that is always going to be the number one regret for people is not taking action. And there's no real excuse for that to be a regret for most Australians. Not like, at all. I know a lot of investors who, and you must see them as well, you're probably some in your client base who don't necessarily have the biggest income, but they've still got the capability to plan for a future through wealth creation through property. And most of them probably start a little bit earlier, right? So you don't want to be... One of these, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna. I'd never did it, and therefore, you know, I don't get to realise the benefits of it. So, for me, that's not a regret. I reckon I could have done more. I wish I'd probably started a little bit earlier, maybe. Yep. But again, that's just a matter of timing. But if I started early, it means I wouldn't have done a whole bunch of other stuff. So, and this is it, right? Know. Like, I mean, yeah, I personally think that most people just need to assess if the time's right, or if the time's about eighty percent right, then you really need to think if I can get the access to credit and I know that holistically in my life, I can actually do this at this stage, it's never going to be perfect. And Mm. you know for well that you might have something happening in life and there will always be something happening in the next six months, 12 months, 24 months, et cetera. Take action when you can and make sure that you're going to hold for the long term. The biggest thing, I think, if you can plan whatever you're going to buy that if you get disruptions after you've bought it and you don't have to sell it, that's the best position you can be in. Don't be an excuse merchant. (laughs) <laughs> something, you have, you know, something you have very good experience oh, God, dude, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, <laughs> I, I only blame myself I don't blame other people yep. I'm sure a lot of people blame you because it's what you do for a living right but, but that blame was a bad for property making, that was a bad there's idea there's very little of that there's actually a lot of geez I wish we did more of that and, and done it sooner and that's typically yeah, I like those phone mm. calls and those discussions. But there is always a sort of Well, they go, Paul, approach. thank you so much. Why didn't we do this earlier? Well, probably why didn't we get more aggressive? Okay. That's probably one thing that you've got to taper it where that's the subjective part of property investing too yeah. is that how much 
is enough, as well as how much can people handle, especially if you're early in the piece and you're getting a first or second mm. or third, is that you know as well as most is that buying a property is a pain in the butt. Our job is to make sure we consolidate that and make it a lot more streamlined, but it doesn't change the fact that you've got to sign documents, you've got to go through all the rigmarole of everything from start to finish. And if you start to have three, four, five, six properties and refinancing to go and buy the next one property, it starts to become a bigger and bigger do, do, nightmare. Do, how do you sort of feed people this information and knowledge? Like, do you write about this on your website or anything? We or? do, we definitely do. We yeah. record short videos. Videos, we try yeah. to make sure we're talking about that regularly. As part of what our service is, we also try to catch up with every single one of our clients every six months mm. after settlement, irrespective of whether they're buying more property or not. Because the key then is you suffer in silence. And so often property investors sit there and say, I know I should be doing something there, but no one's holding me to account. So I'm just going to sort of put that aside for the time being. So I might have equity. I should have raised my rent. I should be looking at my finances as far as where my interest rate is. I should be thinking about what the exit plan for these properties are. All those things is part of what we have to discuss regularly. And that's the part which I think is more important than anything is that if you're actively consuming information that tells me you're probably willing to do something anyway yeah. but if someone's actually going to get on the phone and set up some time with you which is what we do with every single one of our clients to say we're going to hold you to account regardless whether it's do nothing regardless of whether you're going to sell that property pay it down fix your rates do something that's going to better your situation our job's to be that that person on the shoulder <laughs> to nag you to get a better oh, outcome mate, that's what i need when i you know otherwise i don't do anything so where are these videos where do they live they can live on oh, a lot of them are on our website purepropertyinvestment.com okay. we've got a pretty active youtube channel mm. um as well as when people subscribe to our, our email list as well we pump out in information to them typically every two weeks. And, and you can do that on the same website. Absolutely, okay. everything's there. Oh, but yeah, but no we worries. try to provide just that holistic approach, similar to what you guys provide on smartpropertyinvestment.com, yeah. is it's just keep providing information which is current, which is going to be giving people different ways to look at things. Yeah, cool. Go to another break, back with another question. James, get it ready. We'll be back in a moment. Are you looking to capitalise on the projected growth opportunities in Brisbane? Speaking to the local area specialists will ensure you receive the best possible Christmas gift now and in years to come. Streamline property buyers have the most comprehensive due diligence process. Clients are constantly surprised and delighted by their thorough approach, including a 45 plus point checklist. Find out more at streamlineproperty.com.au. The most qualified buyers agents in Brisbane. Welcome back. Q&A episode, Smart Property Investment Show. Hope you're enjoying yourself. We're getting deep dive. We like doing this sort of stuff. It's pretty organic. And uh, as I mentioned beforehand, we'll do some videos around this so you can see how this actually works. Live, audio, visual, way of the future, all that sort of stuff. Next question. This is our last audio question. Then we've got one more email question. So we've got about 10 minutes, Paul. So we're going to have to speed up, I reckon. Let's do it. Um, but I think we should go back to some of these points that we've spoken about you know, philosophy investing and all that. We'll do another podcast on that. Definitely. But James, over to you. Next question. All righty, here it comes. Hi, it's Kylie from Brisbane. I was yeah. wondering if it's better to start adding value to a recent property purchase when you buy it or is it better to wait a few years? I'd love to get some feedback from some of your listeners and see what they think as well. Cool. Good question, Kylie. Thanks so much for sending it in. Do really appreciate it. Now, this is a uh, well, I look at our portfolio, and I'm sure you've got some experience around this Massively. as well. You know, the question is around, and this is going to sound very technical, is about when do you choose to manufacture equity in mm. you know, property is how we can frame this particular question. So you're a buyer's agent. This is what you do. You've got to identify value yeah. in a property, and that value might be it's really, really under market for whatever reason. This is the reason why, and what could be the market value of this property at a point in time, should I do A, B, C? Now, mm. A might be just buy it really, really cheap and leave it, and then maybe in three years' time when the market shifts, you can spend a few bucks on it, tart it up, and you know sell it on or do whatever you do, get a bigger rent, or you can renovate immediately and bring it up to that market value. Mm. So it depends, right? It, massively. it really, really depends. But how do you frame those decisions? It's such a key part of property investing, and I think it's something that's transitioned heavily, and you would have had full experience in your portfolio earlier in a piece where you did some pretty hefty large-scale renovations, mm. maybe not additions and structurals, but Big literally gut stuff. outs. Yeah. yeah, And this is the difference between probably knowing what your cash-on-cash cash return can actually deliver, not subjectively, mm. but when the rubber meets the road, someone valuing your property to then extract equity to say you're actually getting a return on that investment. And I'll frame it this way is that you spend $400,000 on an investment, you might be buying, and I'll give it, a, this is a real life example of a property we settled for a client as of Tuesday of this week in Bray Park, northern suburb of Brisbane. The property was a pre-mortgagee, so we bought it off market from an agent who had this client who they knew, well, essentially the seller knew full well that they were behind on mortgage repayments by about six months. The bank was either one discussion from saying, we're going to take it as a mortgagee, they don't want to do that. We knew that we could buy the property. It took a fair bit of finessing, about three months worth of work, and 
end up buying the property for I think three hundred and forty six thousand dollars. Market value on this property is about four ten. It was a ridiculously good buy, but in that same time, this person bought this property about three years ago, and she unfortunately probably had some health issues of her own. The property was in a really bad state of repair. It didn't necessarily need much, but it needed something to get it to a rentable standard. That property, we actually are coordinating about $15,000 worth of renovation. That's paint, carpet, blinds, yard tidy-ups, and a few other basic things. That's a fair bit of money, in my opinion. And then it comes down to what is that fifteen grand going to give them? Are they going to go get that 410 valuation after they spend this fifteen grand? In all likelihood, no. And this is where it comes down to knowing what the bank's appetite to revalue your property two weeks after buying it is actually mm. going to be. And sort of 2010, 11, 12, 13, when you could actually do that and you could go get another bank to revalue a property which you deem to be bought at a certain price and then all of a sudden a different bank's got a different valuation platform which will give it a 50 grand uplift in value and drag out equity. Well, we did that. Exactly. Yeah. You did it over and over and that was your it was a strategy and it was a bona fide strategy for a lot of people for mm. a period of time. The appetite for banks to do that now and the ability for banks to do that now more or less doesn't exist. Yeah. And if you're hedging a bet saying you can do that, that's when you're going to run into struggle. Because if you went down that same process and from Kylie's perspective, having a property in Brisbane and thinking, do I value add to this property? And let's say arbitrary numbers, she's got a $600,000 property and she's thinking about doing a nice renovation on a kitchen, bathroom, paint, blinds, et cetera. She's going to drop 60 grand into that property, let's say hypothetically. Yes, you might see comparables on the market that might be worth seven, 750 and you might think oh, I can get some money out of that, but is a bank going to go value that? And even if they do value above that, are they then going to release equity at the full amount? No, they're not. They're potentially going to release up to 80% of what you added value to. Mm. So then the question comes is, what would you otherwise do with that 60 grand in that situation? So then I look at saying, well, if you're going to put 60 grand instead of into that renovation, but into a $400,000 high performing investment, that's a 10% deposit plus closing costs. Mm. So if you can actually leverage then that money compounded over the next 5, 10, 15 years, if you can balance the cash flow on that next investment, is going to hands down outperform your renovation. So do you add value to property? I like to think maximize what you need to do with a minimum amount of money spent from a rental perspective to get it into a two, three, four, five year period initially. If you're looking to sell, Personally speaking, that's when I do think then you can start to justify how can you actually maximise the value. Because the market will determine what the it's market worth will rather determine. than the bank. And it, the bank doesn't care. The bank's got no play in that and you're not relying on the bank to give you a valuation mm. which you think it is. You, you say in this market, I know that that sale down the road sold for this and if I can bring it to that standard, I'm going to be able to get that sale price. I can justify that over and above spend because I'm actually going to get the money out of the property 100%. Mm. That's when I want to be doing it. That's really well said and well answered, Paul, and very complicated though. I reckon a lot of people's mind just boggled, like, you know, because I, I do this a lot. I, I kept up where you're going, but you spoke about a lot of really quite complicated, you know, outcomes that, that yep. for, through that process, you know. But to summarise the tactic of manufacturing equity to increase the capital value of a property is a good one. Yep. But- it doesn't work in all markets. No. It doesn't work in all financing conditions. It doesn't work in all economic or political environments. You know, back in the day when we – and I think about it, and I think you saw this property, this asbestos pit in uh, Cambridge Park. You go on to smartpropertyinvestment.com.au and we did a big reno on it, which – and I apologise if I get these numbers wrong because it's been so long since, since I've discussed it, but it's all online. You can go and check it out. We bought this place, Cambridge Park, which is near Penrith, 235000 or $36,000. A four bedroom property. Uh, it looked like you know a crack then that the bank at wouldn't the time value wouldn't it. only valued the the value of the land rather than the value of the property. So we had to tip in extra money, or we had to do something creative. Where we had I, I can't remember. I wrote the story. Go and yep. check it out. We gutted it. We completely transformed it, and that thing now sits in our portfolio worth six hundred and forty seven hundred thousand yep. dollars, right? And a really good yield on it. Yep. So it's been a great story, but at that point in time. We realised the value in that property, as in what everything else in the area was in terms of rent and uh, valuation. The banks then valued up a lot nicer. Yep. Um, and we went, okay, take a punt. I think we spent 40, 40, high 40s, 50,000 bucks on it. Yep. And it was a real success story. Yep. But that was for that market. Probably Correct. couldn't do it today. No, and the market 
predominantly was doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you in that scenario too. And that's the bigger consideration to say, this is probably the unfortunate part of the glory of renovation shows is that it is hard money to earn. And we no just one- just got to wash a block, right? Those yeah. things always get hammered. Like no one, people always overpay. Absolutely. And the work that goes into a renovation, you then need to do a calculation on what are your hours worth? Because yeah. you're going to spend time. And if you calculate what your hours, your weekends, your after hours, your before hours, and then you say, well, is it worthwhile me doing it or do I subby it out? And mm. and all those things, there is, it is not free money. And then it also is what's the utility of that money? Can it be better leveraged? Yes, and I think that's the key point, Kylie, is that, you know, you're not going to be able to revalue a property six months' time and go, bank, look, I've made it no. so much better. They're just going to go, don't care. There's not going to work in this current market. But what else can you be doing with any cash that you put into manufacturing greater equity in a current asset to park it in something else? And there's a whole diversification play yep. as well, right? Agreed. You know, But you don't want, again, to earlier point you made, Paul, about simplifying your portfolio so there's not too many moving parts. The bigger your portfolio gets, the more moving parts, the yep. bigger the heck it is. That's what I find right now. It's managing our portfolio is a nightmare. Absolutely. You know, and absolutely. that is a sweet spot. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So let us know how you get on, Kylie. hope that was beneficial. Ask the big questions. Just work out how your money is working most effectively for you. And that should always be the central position where you land. Okay, last question. We're going to have to – I don't want to speed through it too much because it's quite relevant, Paul, but um, we'll be succinct in our response to it. And this is from Terry B. Thanks, Terry. Uh, you didn't really – Tell us where you're from, but I'm assuming you're from New South Wales. You write, uh, I'm thinking of attending an auction at Petersham this weekend. I'm worried about the impact of the coronavirus on property sector. Should I be concerned? Question mark. Right. Topical. Topical. Very well, topical. The World Health Organization says just be conscious and know what's going on, but – don't worry too much, but be worried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when we were sitting, I think at last count in Australia, I think it might be a dozen or so people who have been Confirmed infected by cases, it. Yeah. It's not really something that we are necessarily concerned about what happens in Australia. It's probably what's happening externally <coughs> that's affecting yeah. Australia. And by the way, me and Paul don't know anything about this whatsoever, so I'm not claiming to think of anything we say about not this. At, not you at know, all. I am, I've got no idea, really. I'm reading what everyone else is reading, but- Effect on property market. So the things that we've assessed, and, and this is very, very topical because I've literally probably received at least half a dozen calls from oh, they, prospective called, yeah. clients of ours thinking about buying property and coming to us for strategy of saying what happens or what's happening with the coronavirus and how's that going to affect the market. They're literal verbatim questions we've received mm. as of the last couple of weeks, which you've got to think, well, regardless of whether it does have or doesn't have an effect, it's having an effect on people's psyche. And ultimately, the reason why we get all these reports on people's position or their thoughts on what they want to do with their money in the next 12 months their state of mind affects the state of wallet. So that's mm. going to happen in some way, shape or form. But if we look at the reality of things that are happening is that we've got no doubt going to be a downturn in Asian tourism into this market. And we've had, that's already started. And that also has a flow on effect to tertiary education and, and people who are coming here to start their university for whatever semester they're going to be. Whether this is going to be for another few months or, or potentially five to six months or even potentially throughout the year, it's going to affect our economy, I think, a little bit. It already has proven to say that you look at the last RBA minutes, they brought it up in February RBA minutes, that it is something that they're concerned about. And I dare say that the one thing that this will probably do, and look, this is going to be on air so people can go back and say who was right or wrong, but I dare say this is probably going to almost solidify a rate cut either in the March or April timeframes, which we'd expect, and potentially a second, depending on how deep it's going to go. But one thing it is doing, it is affecting the share market. And we're seeing that what happens in the back of when the share market is affected, if we look at historical hits to the share market, both globally and Australia, is that the flight to property starts to become a little bit more heightened. So there is definitely a bit more of an impact on people going to that safeguard of bricks and mortar. So we're expecting that people are actually, especially owner occupiers, are seeing that there is more demand in that space for owner occupiers as well as investors because of the fact that we're going to have rate cuts almost be confirmed because of this. Um, and this is probably just going to be the straw that broke the camel's back. And mm -hmm. then second to that, you're looking at the fact that longer term, people do flight to property and bricks and mortar in terms of uncertainty globally. Yeah. There's a couple of, um, I was getting a coffee earlier today and uh, I'll just read, I'll flick through the papers when I'm down and see what's going on. The Daily Telegraph, for example, yep. is like, you know, ScoMo is talking about, I've just Googled quickly, just give some context. This is on The Australian, you know, a very reputable publication. And the headline says, 
Everyone will get coronavirus, virologist warns as Scott Morrison activates pandemic plan. And it says Scott Morrison has moved ahead of the international health authorities to activate a pandemic plan as one of Australia's leading viruses declared everyone will contract coronavirus. But for most, it will be no worse than a bad cold. You know, just be aware, I think. And if you're concerned or worried, don't buy a property. Yeah. Let it play out. But unfortunately, in this market, I'll tell you one thing that's not going to stop is what's happening, which is 80% plus clearance rates, which is going to be money getting cheaper mm. and is going to be a lack of supply coming to this market over the next two and a half to three years based on approvals that really fell off a cliff last year. Those things aren't going to change because of any yeah. pandemic and that's going to affect the market over the next well, two or three also, years. Also, you know, and, and Terry, you know, whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty type person, a lot of people might be sitting there thinking it's probably the best weekend to go to auction because there's going to be a lot less people out there, which means that my ability to skew a property might be better because there's going to be less competition. It's yep. one way to frame it. Absolutely. You know? I completely agree. And I, look, it hasn't changed our plans and hasn't changed. Mm. My, I've got an auction on Saturday personally for a site that I'm looking at and, um, and I'm gearing up for that to be a very hotly contested auction. As much as I don't like to go to auctions, this one's a forced auction as a deceased estate and that's something that I'm personally going to and, and gearing up for. Great. All right, I think we've done pretty well. That's a long episode. I hope you uh, enjoyed that and we're going to do a lot more of this. Please keep those questions coming in. They're really cool um, where you listen to this on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. If you're on one of the podcast players, go back to the website and look at the podcast there and you can click that button that says record and just send it in. It's really, really easy stuff and we'll get it played on air and we get them answered. So uh, James knows what's going on, but deliberately we're just giving straight off the cuff uh, response. It's like the good old days of... Um, your money on Sky, where you sit there live, where you sit <laughs> there li- sitting li- there live on air, just going piece in, thinking, "Jesus, a bit of a h- tough question. How do I figure this out?" People are recording what I'm saying, and yeah, and the answer is always go back to the th- fundamentals. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the, the fundamentals. three fundamentals. I, three you fundamentals. know what? To be fair, I don't think we use that once. This whole discussion, the word fundamentals. The fun- fundamentals. I'm glad we didn't. I know. Let's make that. We'll get a fundamental counter. It's banned. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's it. Maybe that's it for a rule for this podcast for this studio is that the word fundamental. Whoever's yeah. using it, it's going to be a shout. Oh yeah. <laughs> I watched um, in the South Park at the moment. I, I digress. But <laughs> at the moment. At, at the moment. Like, yeah. just when I, I get home late, I go, like, I eat something and go, I, yep. I just don't want to think about Shut anything the other off. than. And there was a parody where they took the piss out of, I think it was Chicago Hope. This is back, I don't know, that would have been 2007 10, or 10, something or other. Years right? ago, yeah, yeah. yeah. When the first time the word, and I don't want this to be an expletive podcast, S H I T was said on. TV, right? Right. So they did a parody of it and they did exactly the same thing. And every time they said that word, this counter, <laughs> was a little counter at the bottom of the thing, just going to go, bloop, 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 and then that being like 200 or something or other. So let's do the same. I reckon you same do for it. The fundamental. There's no, in, in our Q&As, no fundamentals. Zero say, fundamentals. All right. Thanks for coming in, mate. I no, do appreciate welcome, it. Mate. I do enjoy it. Let's do it more often. Get you back in the studio. And if you've got any specific questions for Paul about anything we've spoken about or his business, look, I'm happy to be a conduit editor at smartprotinvestment.com.au. And if it's for him, just put it in the subject field and I'll flick it straight over. Or if they want to get directly in contact with you, what do they do? Yeah, they can reach out to me directly, book a time in my calendar, purepropertyinvestment.com, and they literally hit the schedule button and that'll go straight to my calendar. Okay. And I imagine you're so busy, they've got to wait, what, four months to try no, and get some not, of your, not at your all. valuable they, time? They can give us a call as well and usually book some time in alternatively to that. But um, I always try to make time for new clients and, right. and existing clients for that matter. Cool. Nice one. Thanks for joining us today as we uh, navigate property investment. I hope that was a value. We do enjoy it. We'll do a lot more of it. If you're not yet checking in with Smart Property Investment every single day, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, social media, Smart Property HQ, which is for headquarters. Uh, It's where we do a lot of posting and you can keep connected. Please, if you like what we're doing on this podcast, there's only one favor that I can ask you for. Can you please keep those reviews coming wherever you listen to them? Uh, I imagine a lot of you are on the, the iTunes podcast player. Really easy. Just click the how many stars you want to give us. Five stars, if that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it might actually be down because you're here as a guest. Uh, yeah, that probably, sure. it probably it usually, loses me a star. Usually is, yeah. Probably well, loses me a star. Hopefully. And put a comment in there as well, whether it's what you'd like to see more of or whatever, but it's just not me uh, here behind the microphone. We've got a really talented team, passionate broadcasters who love this show and they get a real kick out of knowing what they're doing is contributing to your wealth creation journey. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. 
If you're a regular listener to the Smart Property Investment Show, then odds are you're already a property fanatic who loves hearing stories on investing from real people. The good, the bad and the ugly. Be with people just like you and join the group Passionate Property Investors on Facebook now. Become part of a community who know what to do and when to do it. And the time to do it is now. Passionate Property Investors. Tribe, tools and tips. Find us on Facebook today.